You're watching Oilers Nation Radio. Happy Tuesday, everybody. I hope you're having a wonderful afternoon. Nothing is going wrong in the world at all. Not today. Oh, boy. Why? You upset about something? Uh, Connor McDavid is hurt. Ah. Well, I don't good. know if you guys watched the game last night. Uh, the football game? We're going to talk about that. I'm also going to mention we do have a new intro loaded into the Roadcaster. Mm -hmm. But Stuff. we're going to save it for when Rick's here. We're going to do a blind reveal of it. Yeah, blind reveal of it. So pay attention Friday. Set your calendars accordingly. Cold open, they call that on TV. Mm. Mm -hmm. And actually the intro is just going to be 10 to 15 minutes of just the <laughs> office cold intros. And then we'll get no, into no, the podcast. No, 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 Tyler, no. we're going to start off with a delicious debate for our friends at Odd Company. Proud partner of the Nation Network on the all-new Nation Beer called Nation Beer Everyday Lager. I myself had, well, at first they were happy Nation Beers last night. Then they turned to sad Nation Beers. Either way, it is perfect bop, bop. for your next big game, your next go-to lager, or just because it's a Tuesday and you need one. Please drink responsibly. You can find it at Odd Company and over at Liquor Connect. If a liquor store near you does not have it, go on in there and ask why. Demand it, I say. Yeah. Say, what are you doing with your life? Or you don't have a na uh, nation beer in here right now. Go straight to Odd Company. They got two locations in the Edmonton area or in Edmonton. They certainly do. They certainly go, uh, go check out our friends at Odd Company. Grab it yourself at least a four pack. Maybe a couple flats. Three <laughs> to six. Whatever. Tyler, you got a delicious debate for us? All right, so it's obviously going to be about the Connor McDavid injury, and it's been, you know, whatever now, 21 hours since it all went down. We're still waiting for information generally, but right before we started recording here, Elliot Friedman did send out a note saying, while we await news on McDavid's health, the Oilers are bringing up Drake Kajula and Noah Philp from AHL Bakersfield. Kajula last played for the Oilers December 29th, 2018. Philp, 26 years old, has not played an NHL game, but again, was right in the mix, probably deserved to break the break camp with the Oilers after how well he played in the preseason. Um, that probably means it has to come with a corresponding move. And they could, I guess, you know, like... What do you wait. mean? Well, so they have $1.2 million in cap space right now, yes. according to our friends over at Puckpedia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They could, I guess, just start going in LTIR, dip into their LTIR pool. We don't want is, that, though. No, because it means you stop accruing cap space, which, again, maybe they're okay with doing for a little bit. So you just... K and LTIR, boom, boom, you're, you're kind of good to go there. Um, it could also come with, like, maybe they wave Travis Dermott and just say, hey, no one's going to claim this guy. Let's get the 775K. How dare you. And then you could bring up two forwards and continue to accrue. Point is, um, it sounds like they're going to be without McDavid for, well, we know for at least one game because he flew back to Edmonton. Yeah. I would assume if you're going through the pain of bringing up two players when, again, you're only missing Connor McDavid here. Um that it's probably going to be a little bit longer. So let's talk about what's the best way for the Oilers to get through this. And the delicious debate will be how should the Oilers set their lineup without Connor McDavid? <laughs> the hard part about this exercise is like, no matter what they do, you can't duplicate what Connor McDavid does in the lineup. Like get that out of the way. That's captain. Obvious speaking. Yeah. He's the best player on earth. You lose that guy for one game or whatever it is. You're not going to replace him. But have we considered dressing Kajula and Philip together in the same jersey? On top of each other. To replace him. What number does Philip wear? Two players in a trench coat. Surely it doesn't add up to 97. Didn't, I, what, didn't he, did he wear 48 in preseason? I don't remember. Let's we have the technology to find that. Kajula is 36, I would assume still. I think uh, Jack Campbell gave him the okay. Yeah. Should be fine. Philip wore 47. Plus 36. 47 plus 36. That's Go ahead, Liam. Three... 83. So the Hemsky. We, <laughs> need looks to find like it. we need to find another 14. Kajula yeah. appears to be wearing, was wearing number eight in preseason. Oh, well, that is not going to work. It's going to have a lot That's of work to get to it. No. Oh, boy. We tried. We so I hope Griffin Reinhardt gave him the okay. How should, that settles it. How should you know what's actually, it? this is so dumb and such a Awesome aside. way to start a podcast. But if Drake Kajula comes up, when he first came up as a rookie, <laughs> oh, no. he wore 91. Uh, okay. And then he eventually was allowed to change, yep. so he wore 36. Or maybe it was the opposite. Yeah, it might have been the opposite. Either way. He was 36 at one point, then he was 91. If he comes up, he'll be wearing another number, presumably. 
How many Oi- how many players have played for the Oilers and worn three different jersey numbers in their careers? Yakupov had two. Yeah. Yakupov had two. Mike Comrie had two. Puliarvi had two. What about guys like Rebishkov? He came back a couple of different times. He always wear the same number? I would assume so. What about Peter Nedved? He always wear number three, 93 when he came mm, back? I think so. Mm. Bouchard wore always, a couple of different ones. Gagne yeah. always came back and wore his number. Uh-huh. Puliarvi wore a couple of different ones. Mm-hmm. That's a great Anyways, question. Double that side. is the true delicious debate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who's worn the most jerseys in Oilers history? I far prefer that one. Um, but anyways, how many, uh, or what's, what's kind of your top nine, top 12, I guess, sort of look like here? Do you keep any of the current lines together and maybe just drop in one of the replacement players to like the Nuge and Hyman duo? Are you doing kind of major surgery here to the line combos? What would you do? I, th- I think if I'm just going to do it, I'm basic bitch and I'm just going to slide everybody in the centers up one and then put Philip in either that third or fourth spot. Down. So you would do like Nuge, Dreisaitl, Hyman, yep. keep a top line. Then you would go like Henrik, Pudkoles, and Arvidsson. Then you'd go Skinner and Brown with one of Ryan or Philp. Yes. I see the logic there. That's the basic Coach Dan fix. I I mean, like, I don't think you're actually far off, though. I think that's probably the most likely, at least to start. I think we're going to get a blender. Like, of course we are. But I think we're going to get a major blender here for however long he's out. Well, what what combinations did we see on... On, jeez, uh, everything. Yeah, hey, the highest played line together. I think it was like Yamark, Ryan, and Brown or something weird like that. Yeah, like basically it was through a blender. It was super blender. That was blender on overdrive. Yeah, you have it that time. Yeah, I got the forward line minute report here. Um, the Oilers had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different combinations of forwards play a shift together. Forty seconds. Um, mm. The worst one being Nuge, Yanmark, and Perry, who played 40 seconds together and somehow were on the ice. For, oh, that's two shots. I thought that was two goals. I'm like, how does that even happen? It was 40 seconds. But, I mean, they did allow six, so I can see where you get confused. Um, <laughs> what would you, BM, would you just do what Dan said, or would you maybe? I think so. Really? I think so. Like, I, I still think Nuge is better on the wing. Yeah. And, like, you use him at center in a pinch, but I don't think, like, I don't think that's the move. I think Adam Henry can go up to the top six and be effective. Mm-hmm. He's always been a top six forward. Mm. I think he can probably do it. I think you would start with probably Nuge, Dreisaitl, Hyman as your first line, I think. And then underneath, who knows? <laughs> yeah. I do remember a point last year where Nuge and Henrique actually played together and looked pretty good in that stretch. So... I, and I also, I mean, last game notwithstanding, because it was just a disaster from the jump, but, like, I did like the dry... I have liked the dry side of put Coles and Arvids in line, so I think I would go with something that maybe doesn't disrupt that line as much, and I also think part of it, too, and we're probably going to find out in the next 24 hours just how serious this injury is for Connor McDavid, but if Connor's going to miss, you know, only, let's say it's a week or it's two games... Maybe you just sit there and go, hey, we like what that second line's doing. We like what that third line's doing. Henrik, Skinner, and Brown I actually think have been okay. Maybe you do, as much as you don't love the idea of Nuge as a center, and I don't. Maybe you just put Yanmark up on the top line with Nuge and Hyman. And it's obviously no longer your oh, top no. line, but just in the way it's listed right now. Throw Yanmark up there. Throw one of Philip or Kajula down on the fourth line. And you keep the second and third lines as they're currently constructed. Liam, what are you doing? Um, I am... Going a little crazy. Let's do it. I'm bumping Pud Colson and Dry up to the top line with Hyman, and I'm doing Nuge, Henrik, Arvidsson, and I'll do Skinner, Philp, Brown, fourth line. I'm going to assume one of those guys... Is one of those guys going down? No. Nah, they wouldn't send on Derek Ryan right now. But then how can they call it Philp? Like, I know Travis Dermott, but that doesn't make... We talked about on the show, like, they kind of need another defenseman just in case something happens. Yeah, and again, know. like, I don't think this will happen, but if Dermot does get claimed, they're even in a worse spot than they were there's, with their PTO signing. There's no way he gets claimed. I don't think so either, but who knows? I didn't think Lavoie was going to get claimed five times. <laughs> I swear he had a busy week. It's really incredible how much I miss Cody CC. I don't. I, I get it. I but I, it's, uh, those tweets that drive me insane. Sorry. <laughs> I just. Uh, you increased the mute list? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did last night. Totally. How many you figure? I, I, three or four. 
Oh, more. That's a weird style. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I just, I don't know. I guess just back to this question. I wonder if they're just kind of tired of this same recipe happening every night. The penalty kill has been brutal. Yeah. A lot of those bottom six guys are in the penalty kill, or on the penalty kill, sorry. So, hey, yeah, Derek Ryan, or Yam Mark, who we just sent you a three-year deal, probably not him. You're going down because you are literally contributing nothing. And uh, Kajula, we'll see. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you have a guy like Kajula who's a bit more hungry. I, I granted, I don't think he's going to have a massive impact on this lineup, but he's definitely going to bring a bit more. Listen, speed. last time I saw Drake Kajula live in person, he beat the shit out of Andrew Cogliano in game six of the second round of the 2017 playoffs. He scored so. a big goal in that series against the Ducks, too. Pretty sure. I had the game up late. Um, I don't think, I think they might just be using LTIR pool, which I believe they are within their right to do here. Yeah. Uh, you're just going to stop accruing for a little bit. So I guess that makes sense. Um, it's I surprising do, they brought up two, though. Which almost, again, <laughs> there's so many different ways you can view it, but like. Trade? No, I view that <laughs> as like McDavid. It's not a week for McDavid, it's multiple weeks. Without Connor McDavid. Because then why? If it was like, hey, it's three games, then I think you would just be like, all right, bring up Drake. We know he's our 13th forward or review him as our 13th. Play him for two games, mm-hmm. get him back down. But like, Philp and Kajula to me is like, okay, we know we need to make it through six to eight games here, potentially more. So have to because someone's got to be like, we want the insurance policy. Because you could have just brought up one and then kept accruing a little bit of cap space. And alternatively, though, you may just have an injury that we don't know about. Could be someone else picked up, yeah. Up. Then they're worried about longevity and not having an extra skater. Yeah, someone, I mean, it could be as simple as someone woke up today under the weather and they're like, okay, just bring up two if we're bringing up one. There's like a hundred different just Like them. Rick woke up under the weather. Oh. That's, That's why he's, he's not, not here. here. Oh. For reals. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah, I'm not lying. Us <laughs> I didn't make that up. He didn't there. say anything in the group chat. No, he just texted me directly. Ah. Yeah. He wanted to know, first thing this morning, I think it was like 9 a.m., he goes, any updates on Connor yet? <laughs> no, Rick. I like how you I said too it in am waiting. voice, though. <laughs> but you got it, right? Yes. It's interesting. So, yeah, we're all kind of it's torn on what to do. The, I, the you guys, LTIR thing, sorry, I guess for people who, they can retroactively put Kane on LTIR, too. Yeah, they've not, already... Not well, that it would matter, I suppose. They could just put him on right now, and it wouldn't matter. He's not coming back. Yeah, he's on injured yeah. reserve right now, or whatever. Um... Because they put them on LTIR to begin. So they've already like established an LTIR pool. So yeah. Cool. Did you guys find yourself trying to play doctor last night like the rest of social media? Uh, I, no. No. I mean, for me, the only thing that I at least viewed as encouraging was one, and this is maybe more of a football thing, but like you're always worried when you watch a football game and someone goes down and it's non contact, right? And, like, with Connor, I think I would have been more concerned. Like, if he was just skating and then, like, grabbed the back of his leg, you'd be like, oh, shit, that's bad. The fact that you could see where he went in and also that he then got back up, to me, it was like, okay, he didn't, like, snap his ankle in half. This isn't going to be something that's, like, six months, right? Because you would imagine you'd be down in a world of pain if that was the case. Yeah, I wasn't thinking, because, like, how he hit the boards, I wasn't thinking broken ankle or anything. I was worried about his Achilles. Yeah, which I, I understand that too. But again, like he got up. But again, up he got up and he tried to take a couple of strides and then something clicked that it was off. So yeah. I'm hopeful. Like, I mean, I got tagged in a bunch of tweets last night. Bob Stoffer was kind of just like speculating, hoping best case scenario was a high ankle sprain, which best case scenario is a high ankle sprain is not ideal. The thing that I... Unless you're Leon Drysaddle, then he just plays through it. Yeah. <laughs> the only doctor part that I took from it was just the fact that they were flying him back that night which would tell me that they aren't concerned about swelling or anything in the immediate, you know, vicinity around that injury else. They would have just waited and then flown him back kind of thing. So, yeah, which again, there was also a report today that, that they, he flew to Nashville with the team and then he's flying back today. I don't know. Yeah, what, a quick what, pop in at Tootsie's, you know, a couple, couple of light ones. Yeah. It was Rashog that put out there that there was no concern. Just so then, vague. Well, so like even Gregor today on his article at OilersNation.com entitled, Can the Oilers Survive Without Connor McDavid? He says, and I quote, a source told me their initial thought is that it isn't too serious, but they need to do further testing yeah. before determining any sort of timeline for his return. The Oilers play Nashville on Thursday, then they fly home. They will practice in Edmonton before Sunday's road game in Calgary. Best case scenario, he only misses one game, but with them playing Sunday, Monday, next Wednesday, even if he is only out short term, he could miss easily a handful of games because the Oilers got three and four nights starting next week. Or starting Sunday, I should say. Yeah. I have to grind through here. Um, 
Yeah, well, the team really showed up after he left the game. Holy Which was fuck. That was so disheartening. It's really frustrating. There was no, there was zero like, all right, guys, like, come on, everybody do a little bit more here. And it was just like, well, Connor's out. Shit. Well, and then they lost. And I know it's convenient for me as the guy that runs hockeyfights.com, but like for nobody on that team to even just like emotionally have a response for like the city of Edmonton, like the guy that knocked down your captain, even if it wasn't dirty, just punch him in the head and get like a little bit of... I don't know, just cathartic response out of it. But yeah, it really was just empty, flat, and ugly. I don't think they could have afforded to do something like that, though. You go to the penalty box, is a guaranteed goal against. Oh, don't get me like wrong. Yes, but once you reach 5 nothing and 6 nothing, then yeah, you're not coming back anymore. And again, that's goonish and whatever, and you can say all you want, and but poor, that's the sport of hockey. And poor Corey Perry can't fight three times in a week. My man is going to turn to dust. I tried to make the meme to make it happen, but... <laughs> <laughs> that is the craziest star right now in all of hockey. The others fi- literally can't win if they don't fight people. Yeah. <laughs> like, we he has 55 get, career fights. We should have got Matt Rempe. Is he on waivers like a day ago? Yeah. Just, no, yeah. They was, send him down. Uh, oh, so you didn't have to wave him? He's young. Ah, he's rats. Young. Where is Kale Kessie? Was that his name? Yes, he is, it was. Good pull. Great with pull. Hershey, I th- with Hershey, I think. He still plays? He is. Yeah, he just wow. had a fight two, week, two days ago. Three Where's days? Ryan Fanti? He has a goalie fight from a couple years ago. CHL, yeah. Pull him up. Wow, KL Kessie's only 31. Syracuse, I apologize. 24 <laughs> pims in six crunch. games. Hasn't scored not only a goal, but a point since 2013. You know you're well, always a good AHL. That's 23. 20, when you, sorry, 23. 13 would have been crazy. You know, you've had a fun career in the AHL when you have one team seasons where it's just a new team every year. You hit that point. I just think like... When it happened in the moment, I literally thought nothing about it. It just looked like he got tripped. I was more mad that they missed the call on Wierenski. And then I see him sliding down. Then he goes to get up. I moved on with my life. And then when Jack said, Connor McDavid is not on the bench, you just go on Twitter and go, holy fuck. I don't remember an Oilers game where the result mattered so little. I, I The last one I can remember was his rookie season. Calgary. We were in Calgary for the game when he... When Giordano well, took him, and we were just like, yeah, it didn't matter. We won the game. Yeah, they did win the game. Didn't Leon get 50 that night, he too? He did get 50 that and night. we didn't give a shit. Did not care. <laughs> we uh, were more watching the video of him going down the tunnel crying. Yes. Another, uh, another thing with this team right now, like Liam talked about the penalty kill. We can talk about a whole bunch of things that are going wrong, but like they... And it's very frustrating because it's like, man, when they're off, they are so far off right now, but like... They have not lost a game out of their regulation losses. None of them have been one goal games. 6 nothing to the Jets, 5-2 to the Blackhawks, <laughs> 4-1 to the Flames, 4-1 to the Stars. Then there was the OT loss to Carolina. Then it was 6-1 to the Columbus Blue Jackets. So, like, it's one of those when it rains, it pours kind of things, I suppose. But, like, there is so much going wrong for this team. And if they were sitting there and, like, losing by a goal, and you were like, okay, well, they lost by a goal, but... The penalty kill stunk, and Skinner wasn't good enough, and no one in the top six scored. You know what? If one of those things maybe turns around, like they're going to be all right. But it's the fact that like they're losing by three plus goals, or at least yeah, yeah, literally three plus goals every time they lose in regulation right now, and it's like fuck, they're not even close. So like the lack of scoring is one thing, and I, I got numbers there I want to talk about after, but like, I really do believe that's going to turn around. The lack of pushback, though, after Connor went down was just like, man, that's so frustrating. And, like, I don't want to pile on Skinner because he's got more than enough people doing that. But, like, his swings between high and low are just wild. When we were at the game, Tyler, on Friday together, he got the shutout, and there were some huge saves, especially in the third period. I think of Eric Carlson right in the slot. Great pad save. There was a two-on-one. Great pad save. And then last night, nothing. Like, there was a couple of goals when I watched them go in. I go, fuck me. Yeah, that second and third goal were both brutal. I, I thought on the third goal it got tipped, but it, it certainly did not. And then that second goal, like, he reacted to something else. Like, it was so so strange. Like, he didn't even know it had gone in. If you watch the replay, he's so, I don't even know the word for it, but just agitated, I guess, by what had just happened. So It's like a little piece of black tape. Yeah, he got, like, distracted by something. So it was weird. I think he'll obviously be fine, but like maybe you kind of do what you did in the playoffs where it's like, okay, Stu, like Pickett gets the next two. Jersey on Monday is yours. 
Well, the last two, didn't Pickard have over a 920 in his last two starts? Yeah, and there's... Since the Winnipeg game, Skinner has a 9-14 save percentage, besides last night. So, yeah, seven sixty last night. Yeah, last night, that would have definitely made it drop. So, not ideal. He's got to be better. I think the team in front of him obviously has to show a little bit more fight, like we were saying as well. And they're not, not scoring goals. Like, everything that could go wrong at the moment. I think last night was just a perfect example of how the season has kind of been right now. You guys want some scoring numbers? Because I'd love to give them to you. Ooh, wait. Can I give you a number on Calvin Pickard? Sure. I was talking about the PK on today's show. Calvin Pickard's save percentage when the Oilers are shorthanded is 500. <laughs> is that bad? He's giving up 50% <laughs> of 50% of the shots that go on Pickard when the Oilers are trying to go in the net. Hang on. Great. You're saying that on the penalty kill, yeah. 50% of the time, he is a coin flip. He is a coin flip on the penalty kill. So, again, if you go look, goalies in the NHL this season – and let's use 10 minutes as the benchmark. They have to have been on the ice for at least 10 minutes while their team is shorthanded. He has a save percentage of 500, second worst in the NHL, 636. So he's a full 136 column points, lower than second. Don't worry, Stuart Skinner, not that far behind. He's the seventh worst in the NHL. Who has he played against? Chicago, Nashville, and what was the other one? I don't know, but he's given up. Uh, Chicago, Nashville, and then he played Detroit. He's faced oh. 10 shots against when the Oilers are shorthanded. And only two of them are considered high danger. He's missed on both of those. The special teams are a disaster. A mess. I can't even think of... The like, I know they scored on a power play last night, but, like, it was so clearly in garbage time that it barely matters. Well, that, yeah. like... It did, yeah, shout out to the referees for giving us those. Got to gotta bounce not, the books a little bit. Not a penalty. Yeah. <laughs> that last one. Uh, just quickly, one more on Skinner since I have the numbers in front of me, and I do think they're kind of interesting. So Pickard's got the 500 save percentage. He's faced two high-danger shots according to Natural Statric and has allowed two high-danger goals. Skinner is interesting. He's got a 760 save percentage. He's faced seven high-danger shots, and he's actually stopped six of them, which means only one of the six shorthanded goals against that have beaten them or power play goals against that have beaten them, whichever way you say it. Only one of them is from a high danger area. That means he's given up five. So the Pickard one makes you kind of sit there and be like, okay, he's given up two high danger goals, the other ones or whatever. But like the fact that Skinner, maybe the penalty killing thing is more just on goaltending than we think it is. I'm trying to, th th I wonder if last night's goal was the high danger goal against a tip in the slot. I would imagine that would be a high I, danger chance. right? And I do know it's a little bit flawed. I had no like, beef with that one, by the way. No, but that's well how executed. the Oilers should be scoring on their power plays. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> And I know, like, it, the stat can be flawed in a way because, like, I'm thinking back to, like, the first game of the season, Kyle Connor. Wrist shot, top of the circles, beats him. Wasn't a great goal, but, like, it also is Kyle Connor shooting, mm -hmm. so, like, maybe it's calculated not in the best way, but still, those numbers do uh, jump off the page. Well, I'm thinking of, like, the the Pickard goals against as well. Like, one of those was that tip on Marsh or so against Nashville where oh, yeah. they just made, like, a good play. Yep. Sometimes teams are going to score goals. So it's like when... Um, and like, I'm not disagreeing with your stats. They're clearly... <laughs> Terrible. Stats like, are facts. Yeah, like, they are facts, <laughs> folks. It's like when Louis on uh, Louis DeBrusque on a show today says, sometimes the power play is going to score. But sometimes you also need your goalie to make a big save. Yep. It kind of goes hand in hand. What else did Louis say today? Uh, he said the sky was falling. Yeah, Louis is a big uh, <laughs> sky is falling guy. Yeah, he was pretty optimistic. Yeah, he kind of echoed our thing. Disappointing to not see them kind of step up a little bit with their yeah. captain out of the lineup. Um, we talked a little bit about who they're going to recall, which, by the way, uh, the Oilers have officially announced it now that Philip and Kajula are up. So. And no one down? No one down. Yeah. So how are they doing that? They They're do going to dip in LTIR. But they do they not have to more. announce all of that at the same time? Kane is on LTIR. But today's, not a, the, today's not a paycheck day either, is it? Tomorrow's a payday. Well, it would be the payday according yeah. to the cap. No, I think it's every day. It's, oh, it's yeah, every day. It's 189 days. Kane's on LTIR? They just aren't using the space because they're low enough below the cap. Oh, that's how that works. Gotcha. So they can kind of like dip their toe in and then pull it out if they yeah, want? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Okay. I want to give you some more numbers. Talk about the scoring a little mm. bit. Let me walk through this with you because it's nuts. Right now, between Hyman, Jeff Skinner, McDavid, and Arvison, okay? Those are your four guys. They have five goals on 114 shots on net. The expected goal totals for those guys is anywhere from 14 to 16. 
Hyman, 0 on 28, career 13.4 shooter. Skinner, two goals on 36, career average of 11.2. McDavid, three on 30, career average of 15.1. Arvidsson, zero on 20, career average of 11%. It's going to turn around, but right now it is grim. And like I know we talked today on ONE is like, hey, Hyman is due. I think everyone can say that. Nuge is due. But it also gets harder to score when you don't have Connor McDavid as your center. So the idea that they're just going to flip the switch and turn on the Jets with McDavid out, I would love to sit here and say I'm confident that they, they can gotta do that. They got to change the approach. I, I, have, I have very little confidence that they're just going to flip a switch in the next week. Boy, would I love to be wrong and have people clown me for this, but like. Well, I don't that's know, one man. of those ones where you'd love to be wrong. Yeah. But what is the standard then? Like, if it's, just say this is a week for McDavid gone. Like, what do those guys have to do to, I guess, fill the role? Like, if they both score goals, let's say they score two goals each in the next week, is that not good enough? And the Oilers win three of the four? Uh, two of the t- four would be okay. fine by me. If the Oilers go two and two, and Nuge and Hyman each have two goals playing on a line with Adam Henrique, then, yeah. hell yeah, I'm going to give them all the credit in the world. I just... I have very little confidence in that happening, is my point. I just don't know how they can continue to go like this. Mm-hmm. Like, Nuge got a goal the other day, and he worked hard to get it himself. Like, he, he yep. earned that goal. Mm-hmm. Hyman, I don't know what that guy has to do. I feel like the puck could be on the goal line he'd miss right now. Like, surely, just out of luck, something's going to go in, right? We like also got to hope that Dryslot will go supernova. Like he has done in the past when McDavid had the lineup. I think he's played really well. Though. Besides last game, I thought he was really good against Detroit and yep. solid against Pittsburgh too. Yep. So Three, Four points in those two games. Yeah. And, and a big goal against the Pens to get the ball rolling. And he got the overtime winner against mm-hmm. the Penguins too. I think yeah, Ekholm's done really well recently. Like They have the pieces there still obviously to do it, but like people are going to be like, oh, there's nothing about McDavid. It's like, yeah, well, that's like, $12 million they have wrapped up in a guy. No kidding. Like They're missing $12 million off that lineup. So I think these guys can get it done. I, I wouldn't say I'm confident that they can do it based off what we've seen, but I do believe they have the ability to step up. I don't think last night was a good example of what this team is. I think last night was an example of essentially rock bottom in one game, not on the whole season. I just like, it couldn't have gone worse. No, Even with McDavid, like if impossible as it is to take that out of the equation. That game could not have gone worse. They hit the post three, four times, I think, too. That is the microcosm of the season, it seems like. Yeah. Even with good looks, you hit the post or, you, you know, kick save on, like, Arvidsson got one where it was a kick save or, like, mm-hmm. Merzlikens had one where he threw his leg out and it just kind of hit it. That's the way she goes this time. <laughs> oh, well. But we're all teed up for dry side. We'll have a big game of the year. Nashville Predators. Yeah. He's heading into his hometown. Well, and that's the other thing, too, is the Predators are not the team that the Oilers played a little that's, while ago. Yes. That's They've won three games now. <laughs> they are starting to gel. They're starting to figure it out. And, yeah, Dreisaitl is cool. mayor and emperor <laughs> of Nashville, but, like, we're going to need him to be. Or offensive superstar Brett Kulak will st- save the day again. <laughs> Somebody's got to. Yeah. Somebody's got to. It's... uh. It's looking grim right now, and is like, it? I'm not least, feeling great. I mean, Nashville is no slouch. Yep. Calgary is somehow playing really good hockey, and you know they get up for playing us. Although they got stomped yesterday, they did get stomped by uh, Vegas. In Someone Vegas. commented on ONE today. They're like, "Could be worse. Could have lost five nothing to Vegas, right?" And I was like, "Oh no, this is much worse than that." Calgary yeah, lost six one to Columbus and McDavid's are. We are the other side of that. Could yeah. be worse. Calgary have lost three in a row. That'll, okay, so that's come good, back down still, that's good. Yeah. And they, I bet the Oilers also then get New Jersey, they who is a good don't team. have McDavid now. Though they do own Markstrom. They do, which would be great. Which would, you know, from my lips to whatever, however that saying goes, manifesting. From your lips to my lips, we, we kiss, kiss if they laid up Markstrom. That's right. Bird that's the, the same. Roof. Birds on the roof. <laughs> are Birds worth in two in the bush. That's right. Something like that. Yes. All I know is I've got a net and I'm Dude. chasing birds. Why do you have bushes on the roof? <laughs> well, there is a place in BC, I'll Google it, where there's goats that live on the roof of a place. Uh, it's a winery, isn't it? Roof I think I've been there. BC. It's in Coombs, BC, uh, at the mm. Old Country Market. Mm. That makes sense. 
They got goats that live on the roof, yeah. Liam. They're lovely. There was another saying I was just thinking of. Oh, well, life Ken gives you lemons. Ken Holland would say when talking about defensemen mm. that you don't win with shrubs in the playoffs. You need some trees. Referring to how he liked tall defensemen. That makes sense why you got Troy Stetcher. You can't <laughs> teach <laughs> that. <laughs> can't yes. teach big. Can't teach it. Speaking of which, Vinny D'Arnais is probably going to be a healthy scratch in Vancouver again. Yeah. I was saying that Vinny <laughs> texts them all the time. Oh, that was Skinner that was saying that he uh, yeah. can't get him to stop texting him on our social media. Great job, Waz. I, uh, Vinny on waivers. That'd start a conversation. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it? God. I was talking to Quads about it because literally he was texting. I'm not even lying. I'll show you my phone. He was texting me Vinny DeHarnay flubs from last night's Canucks game Ooh. at like 2 a.m. Oh, this is keeping our boy Quads up. It is. So I'm like, what do you think is going to happen? He goes, I bet the Canucks trade him by the end of the season. Darn. Damn. It's too bad. Like Sometimes goes, moving teams is, well, we're seeing it right now. The grass now. isn't always greener. Like, you have to go and make a, especially when you're a guy like that, you have to go make another whole coaching staff love you. Yeah. yeah. And I don't think there's any denying that, like, this coaching staff really, really liked Vinny, and he stayed in the lineup at times. I, I'm not saying he was a bad player. Like, he was a fine player, but, like, he stayed in the lineup at times, maybe longer than he should have, specifically in him versus Philip. To Robert. his credit, new city, new system, new people around. Like, Very it might hard. take him a minute. Yep. Maybe he comes back. I kind don't think I so. hope not. <laughs> kind of fold him. Two mil. Is there a reason he left? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he secured the bag a little bit. We're allowed to uh, talk about Vinny in this way because Rick is not here. Should we talk about Yamok? <laughs> well. No, because I'm still here. <laughs> ah, I. Our guy, Bruce Kerlock, he is, he's a smart man. He said that this Kajula call-up should have some players in the bottom six. You know, thinking a little bit. Maybe I taking, hope so. Wake up, boys. I hope so. Competition is always a great thing. But, uh, man, we got to hope that it sparks something. Somebody. Somebody needs to get going. Uh, someone, on Bob, someone called Bob Stoffer on Twitter. Said, as a result of the recalls, the Edmonton Oilers will no longer be accruing cap space and will be in LTIR. Confirmed. By, I guess Bob. Is it the actual Bob or is it a fake Bob? Real Bob. Let me check. It's a real Bob? It's real Bob, yeah. Because sometimes I uh, I still get caught it's up by the him. fake gyms. I seen him on my TV on <laughs> Saturday. That's not him. That is, it could be anyone. Interesting to see how long they're going to have to be operating in LTIR and how this will affect their deadline cap space. <laughs> Bald Kajula is a look. <laughs> wow. I hadn't seen this picture of him. It is a... He, yeah. It is something. He's not the... twenty. Yeah, he, oh, definitely. He's There are some people who you see him bald and you're like, damn, that works for you. Yep. Kajula is one of them. Yep. Well, he's got a nice shaped head, I see. You know? Whereas on the other side, Noah Phelps, great head of hair. See... It's situations like this where now the others have dove into the LTIR space, which is what it is. I have I didn't really like that they just had 12 forwards and you lost Lavoie because of a decision like that to accrue money. And I understand the idea of like getting all this money is awesome. But having 13 forwards and being able to rotate guys too and change things when things aren't working is also a really good thing too. And now they're in a situation where... They can't accrue money because they let someone like Lavoie go or sent Phil down earlier. You know There's what I mean? There's also like, like the angle too of, you know, putting the cart before the horse in the sense totally. that like we're accruing cap space for the trade deadline. Well, you got to win games now. Yeah. What if you don't get to that point? And, and I believe will, the others will. will. I, yeah. I really, really do. But there's also like, you know, you can't always look so far ahead. You got to live in the moment sometimes. You got to smell the flowers. I just, I think we would have been kicking ourselves at the deadline if they had $2 million to spend, and we were sitting there going, you know there was a way for them to have more than double that? And it's like, eh. Maybe. I don't know. Sure. I, I don't know. I, I stand by them doing that. I think it was smart. I don't I don't think, I'm, it's not, I don't lose sleep over it. No. I'm either. just thinking it's one of those ones where you go, you know, you put the cart before the horse just a little bit. And again, I said this on other shows too, like, I also think having a forward that makes $800,000 less contributing to your lineup is also a really good thing. Do they have any of those? No, I'm uh, Lavoie. Is yeah, I know. That's what I mean, right? Oh, it's like, Philp. <laughs> well, their cheapest forward is nine hundred thousand dollars. Like you look around other teams in the league, they're finding their bottom six is totally. filled up with guys who are dirt cheap who are finding ways to be good players, and just goes back to like falling in love with bottom six guys. Like I think if let's we, talk about it. Who are you cutting? I don't. Right now, no one. <laughs> but like again, is there not a world where one of Drake Kajula or Noah Philp come in and? 
steal a job. Like Noah Phil totally. probably he probably he deserved he probably deserved to steal Derek Ryan's job at a probably. camp. Yeah. But to Ryan's credit, he was good in the preseason and he was the incumbent, so he didn't lose his job and they wanted Phil to go get some minutes and, and it all made sense. But like I would not be surprised in the least if Noah Phillips played his last game in Bakersfield. What's uh, Kajula's cap hit? Does it say on there yet? I can't remember what they signed him to. Uh, Kajula is 775, so league min. See, if, again, like this whole like occurring cap thing, like mm -hmm. what if it just gets to the point where they're like, like you said, like someone goes down and it's just like, hey, Derek Ryan, Kajula makes a little bit less than you so we can gain a little bit more money from doing that too. Like you have your winger and your center there. So Derek Ryan has not looked good for the last week. And also we wouldn't be the oldest team in the league anymore and people would stop talking about it. Decent point. That would be awesome. <laughs> it's just like, you know what? It's funny. I did the math a little while ago, and I wish I still had it on my laptop. But like, if you didn't have Corey Perry and Derek Ryan, that number comes down quite a bit. If you swap those two, if you swap those two for Kajula and Phil, you go to like middle of the pack. <laughs> it's, I, drives me, it's the worst thing that anyone ever says in our show. So, yes, they literally have two old players and an Adam Henry who contributes. Everyone else is. In their early 30s or late 20s and does perfectly fine on this team. But it also is a testament to them not finding totally. quality young players to bring up that can actually contribute. And losing two young ones that are now more expensive elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, you want to talk about it? I'm I so do, glad I you didn't know, say hey, the <laughs> How is LeVar? I don't want to get muted. <laughs> I don't That's think true. LeVar's doing that good in, in Henderson. He has, oh, two points. Goal and assist. If you quit Twitter, he can't mute you. It's you true. know what was funny? I thought about this in my head. Have you guys seen that list going around? Of It's that hockey stats card. And he, the, whoever it is tweeted out the, a list of the worst games a defenseman has played this season. Oh, oh boy. And Lane, there's no Oilers on it. Oh. But Lane Hudson is on it. And the reason Montreal has Lane Hudson is because the Oilers traded that pick in the Brett Kulak trade to Montreal. So I was like, thank goodness. Like the Oilers didn't trade away a pick and he turned into an absolute stud. I know he's still very early in his career, but... Lane Hudson's going to be a stud. Yeah, he'll be a good player, but right now he's not, so I don't have to hear about it. <laughs> yeah, right now, though. <laughs> right now. Anyway. So I guess the other question is, what do you expect on Thursday? Effort. Way more effort. That's I mean, the bare minimum? I mean, that's the floor, isn't it? Like, yeah, it is. That, I mean, they have to. Surely, like... I feel like obviously game one is what it is, but like you lost to a good team in Winnipeg, but like you should come away from that Columbus game being like, that was not even close to good enough. And it should be a, a wake up call for everyone. Like, who was even good in that game? I can't think of anyone. At home. Yeah, Pickard was probably pretty good. Yeah. Pickard was Mitch. awesome. Yeah. I'm definitely starting Pickard on Thursday. That's, yeah, that was I where would I start was Pickard start. as well. That's the first message to the, to the team right yeah. there. Uh, and then also, God damn, I'd sit Derek Ryan too. Now that now that you're calling these guys up, yeah, I'd just sit there and I'd go, "We need guys who are helping us win." Stu, Dr. Not helping us win. Out you go. It's also you can't even like have the argument right now that Derek Ryan is like essential to the PK. New, no Philp, right-handed center, bigger, faster, maybe. Give it a shot. I thought he played great. Like I, along with the rest of the city, fell in love with the kid during uh, the preseason. I hope he comes up and he doesn't ever go back down again. Me too. Yeah. I think the story's great. Um, oh, my God. Okay, sorry. Just because you talked about it. Goals against per 60 went on the ice shorthanded. Mm -hmm. Derek Ryan is at 38.3 goals against per 60 shorthanded. Second worst <laughs> on the team is at 23. Who's second worst? Yeah, uh, Arvidsson. And then Yanmark at 21. And then there's another gap to Connor Brown, which, to the oldest credit, Derek Ryan's only spent six minutes on the PK this year. And Arvidsson's. Oh, they've been effective then. Yeah. yeah. Arvidsson's only spent seven and a bit or close to eight. And they have moved away from those two, it looks like. But, like, man, that's a bad number. That's Let's a put really Coles in out there. Five minutes. Five minutes. And he has not been on the ice for a goal again. Let's get him out there. I mean, I think speed on the PK. I, I'm with you. I think they're maybe starting to figure out like the guys they can trust are Brown, Henrique, Nuge. Well, the problem is that's probably about it at this point. But maybe well, Colson, it sounds like you need a like sentiment out there at least. Another one. Maybe it's Phil. Henrique and then Nuge. Put Brown with one, put, put Kills in oh, with sorry, the other. Hey, you say Henrique. Yeah. Hmm. There you go. But yeah, the penalty kills a problem. Anyways, I don't forget. What about the power play still stinks? What do you got there? At home in. Practice with different lines again and then just keep going back to the same group. Yeah. Yeah. Put Kajula on there. So once that happens, yes. we don't score. We already don't. <laughs> oh, the answer. Just play four on four. 
We're going to have to rekindle the old Sean Horkov backdoor tap-in. I do think, for real, though, Ekholm should go on that top unit. And I should go. just run two defense. He's finding one. ways to get pucks through better than everyone else. Back-to-back games, he has power play goal. I'd go three and two. It's been a long time since they've gone three and two. Yeah. I just I think it makes a lot of sense. I do, too, frankly. Like, at, at the end of the day, putting the four forwards out there, doing whatever, it's just not working. So move some guys around, get them in spots where they're not comfortable. I would even, like, put Ekholm up at the top, put Bouchard maybe on, like, one of the half walls and just see what you can do. I'd also like that because there are times right now, especially when things are going poorly, where Bouchard's lack of urgency on the back check so is annoying. giving me all kinds of stress on the power play. Maybe, hey, like, we've talked for a while about having a right-handed shot to put on that other side for one-timers. Bouchard. Make it Bouchard. He could crush pucks from there. And he'd be taking the one-timers from more in tight, like... He's not getting pucks. Do you think Ekholm top. could kind of be dishing from the top then to make it work where he's got Bouchard on that one side and Drysdale on the other side? Two yeah. one-timer options? I think he could. Plus, he's also feeding pucks through traffic better than anybody else right now. He mm-hmm. is. Yeah, why not? I'd do that. Why Again, not? what's the worst that happens? Got to give a, a little bit of love here while we're working through the news to our friends at Great Clips. With more than 4,400 hair salons throughout the United States and Canada, Great Clips is the world's largest hair salon brand and official hair salon of the NHL. Salons are locally owned and operated and open seven days a week. Your time is valuable. Use the Great Clips check-in app, see the wait time, check in on your phone, and get your hair cut when you want. For more information, check out greatclips.com. Great Clips! Gotta be great. Tyler got his hair cut there. He looks very handsome. Nice and crisp. Mm-hmm. Dan, next time you go get a nice trim, use the check-in app, would you? It's true. Please? All right. We're going to do a little uh, continuing on, looking around. The odd thing is, Dan, you got a bail? Yes. All right. Sorry. Dan's got a bail. Bye-bye. We're, we're recording later than normal today. Can I say something whilst Dan walks out and of course. Tyler fixes the camera? Yes. Yes, you may. I did not say Donnell Nurse should be on the Canada roster. It was a quote. Just for the record, <laughs> it was reporting the news. <laughs> nothing else and nothing more. So, uh, Leah or Colby Cohen texted me in the article went up and just said, is Liam on crack? I, I do like, not well. endorse this message. <laughs> unless it works. I, so I saw the article go up on socials and the amount of shares and comments that happened like immediately hey, was. We had, to get, we had to get traffic up was wild yeah well and unfortunately the weird part about doing what we do is you said it this morning in our meeting tyler like when things go sideways we tend to elevate our game and get yeah. better somehow as a as a company as the weather's <laughs> nation so savage really yeah i'm not pro nurse on the team i don't think you should make it but we'll see probably not all right defensemen in the nhl who have killed at least 20 minutes worth of penalties this year sorted by goals against per 60 Yep, Darnell Nurse is the worst. Yeah, he is allowed the most <laughs> in the NHL. Uh, don't worry, second worst is at home. He's going to be yeah, best this, at something, though. There's five defensemen who have allowed eight goals against. Two of them are on Detroit, two are on the others, and I can't remember who the other one is. Probably Vinny. It might be Rasmus Anderson, just oh, based yeah, on this. I think I was it. Um, Can we move Michael that Kessler. trade along now? Rasmus Anderson, future oiler, please. There, there is one thing which <laughs> would be the case for Nurse to make the team. In the playoffs last year, he was really, really good on the penalty kill. <laughs> Didn't allow a goal against, was the only defenseman to play more than 30 minutes to not be on the ice for a goal against on the penalty kill, aside from Cody CC, who he played with. Uh, but oh, I oh, oh you miss Cody CC? He's 10th worst on that list. <laughs> oh, my God. Bring him Where back. does he rank on handsome per 60? He's got to uh, be high. One. He's... Oh, Tyler Unless Brady Shea's that. on this list. <laughs> the handsome per 60 list. That's really bad. There are six defensemen in the NHL who have been on the ice for at least 20 shorthanded minutes who have not been on the ice for a goal against. Dylan Sandberg, Jeremy Lazan, Alexander Carrier, Cam York, Nikita Zadorov, and Philip Horonik. Damn. Uh, Darnell Nurse, again, the worst on that <laughs> list. <laughs> so. You say worst, I say best. Read the quote. Mm-hmm. Like the story. You heard it here, folks. Liam Horobin is... Throwing Darnell Nurse's hat in the ring to be a penalty <laughs> killer on Team Canada at the Four Nations Cup. <laughs> I personally think it was a bold take. <laughs> but listen, I'm here to support my friend and his ideas. So there you go. There you have it. 
Let's I can't it. wait till it's like January and this team's like nine games over 500 and we're just laughing. McDavid's leading the league in points again. And it's like, ah, oh, oh, oh. Yesterday's show was so awesome. Well, there's 500. Yeah. No complaints about sure. anything. People were like, how many are they going to win by tonight? <laughs> yep. Well, we were, ta- we were literally talking about Will McDavid an eight point night to get to a thousand points? He will not. He will not. <laughs> he played thirty three seconds yeah, or whatever. That was, it was. That was tough. Tough day. Not ideal. Not ideal. But onward and upward, friends. We'll have to wait to see what the update looks like when news actually comes out. Everybody manifest good health. And if you have to sacrifice your own left leg, it might be something to consider. Mm-hmm. How tall is Connor? Six two. But like real six two, not Tyler six two. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> Whoa. Because I think we could measure and I would be. He's six one, listed at six one. Okay. So I he's think around if, six feet then probably. Yeah, he's probably around six feet. Because I was gonna say I'm I I would be like, yeah, six two on an NHL website. I'm probably like six one and three quarters. Mm. So you have to be at least well, actually, you need to be six feet if you're gonna be sacrificing a leg. We can't have like one long leg and one normal leg. It's just not gonna work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's work together here. Let's solve a problem. So sad looking at his game log from yesterday. One shift, 37 seconds. Fuck. God. Fuck. Uh, anyway, let's wrap up the podcast with a little bit of betting talk, shall we? I don't really want to talk about the Oilers, quite frankly. So thankfully, the betting segment, we're going to talk about some World Series baseball, Tyler. The betting segment is brought to you by our friends at Bet365, proud partner of Oilers Nation Radio. Open an account with Bet365 today and bet on a huge range of markets, whatever the sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. Use the promo code NATION. Promo code is NATION. NATION. The code is NATION. Real quickly before I move off the Oilers. Um, I don't know when the last time you guys looked at the Stanley Cup odds was, but it's moved since the last time I put a wager on it. When I put a couple of uh, dollars down in the summer, it was plus 800. That line has moved to plus 850. The Dallas Stars now favored at plus 800. A little movement there on the line. Yeah, I do. I kind of enjoy tracking that stuff. I know it's weird, but like even Bet365 always updates the point total over unders for teams. And I, it's, a, it's like a little stock market y kind of thing where it's like, okay, Sometimes who's you're... trending in what direction here? It's fun. But what I really want to talk about, Tyler, is the World Series. Yeah. Can I ask you a question? When this series happened between the Dodgers and the Yankees, did you not think it would be closer than what it has? Because, like, I don't know anything about anything. I admit it. But I thought the two teams with the highest payrolls, more or less, Mm -hmm. in Major League Baseball would be a little bit closer than what we've seen through three games. Yeah, me too. Like, I mean, baseball is a weird sport, right? Because you go back to game one. The, the Yankees are one out from taking a one nothing series lead. Freddie Freeman hits a grand slam, and it's like, mm-hmm. man, if Freddie Freeman just gets a little under that ball, popped up, game over, one nothing Yankees, they steal one on the road, and instead it's a momentum-turning thing, and Freddie Freeman's been red hot. One of the only, I think, only the third player ever, fourth player ever, to hit a home run in three straight World Series games, or the first three games of a World Series, so... Um, yeah, like a guy like that just gets on a roll, hits a couple big home runs and low scoring games. And before you, you blink and it's kind of over game four goes tonight in New York. Are you surprised that the Dodgers, despite being up three Oh, are plus one fifteen dogs on this game? It would be something if the Yankees could put it together. No team in the history of the world series has forced even a game six after being down three, nothing really? in a series. So they have all ended, I I saw the number today, I think only one or two times has a game five even been forced. Like when it's been three nothing, historically it has, I think 80, 85% of the time ended in a sweep. Um, The Dodgers are going with a bullpen day today. So I think that might be the reason why the line shifted just because the expectation would be, you know, they're going to burn through a bunch of relievers and they're not going to use any of their good starters. So why why would they do that? It's closeout day. Yeah, why don't they have five? Wouldn't they have five good stars? They really only have three. Oh, um, and then they're going to go back to Jack Flaherty potentially for uh, for Game Five. I think is the plan. Who is their Game One starter? So yeah, they're just going to try grind through a bullpen day here. Yankees are going with Luis Gill. So I don't know. So hypothetically, go ahead. If this game, let's say it's a three-two game, Yankees would bat last in the bottom of the ninth, yeah. right? Would they bring out like I don't even know what Yamamoto? 
No, because he just pitched yesterday. But the with, uh, I remember once, like, didn't Chris Sale do it for the Red Sox? They do. And yeah. Madison, Madison Bumgarner did that for the Giants a bunch of times. Right. Where he would, like, start. He started game five, came out of the bullpen for game seven. Hmm. You do that when it's dire. I think if you're the Dodgers, you wouldn't make a panic play or anything like that this gotcha. early in the series. A couple other lines here, Tyler, if you don't mind, from this game four of the World Series. Over under is set at eight and a half. Over yeah. eight and a half runs is even money at plus 100. Under is minus 120. If you're looking to bet on the spread, minus one and a half, which is the run line, plus 145 for the Yankees tonight. Mm. One thing I like to bet on when I'm betting on baseball, I don't bet on a whole lot with baseball just because I'm not very good at it, but I like to bet on bases. I think it's fun. A couple of different ones here for you. Mookie bets, two bases, plus 140. What's Judge? Aaron Judge, how many bases do you want? Two. Two bases plus 110. He's kind of due. He's been so bad so far in this series that, like, especially with the game being at Yankee Stadium, short porch, he's got to luck into something at some point here. Our old friend, Teoscar Hernandez, plus mm. 150 for two plus bases. Uh, Shohei Otani listed at plus 105, even with the wonky shoulder. Yeah, I know. He was the third leg of my same gamer the other day. There you go. A couple of... Uh, World Series bets for you. I picked Dodgers in six when we went to the Oilers-Penguins game on Friday. See how close I get. I could see the Yankees winning. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. How does it go? Like, it's 2-3-2. Two, 2-3-2. Two. Two, two. Okay. Okay. So we had a couple more games at Yankee Stadium. And obviously the Yankees, they don't want to allow the Dodgers to be celebrating a World Series win at Yankee Stadium. New. So uh, we'll see. Yeah. There you go. A couple of lines for our friends at Bet365 on the World Series. Use that responsibly. Go out and get there. Open an account with Bet365 today and bet our huge range of markets, whatever sport, whatever the moment. It's never ordinary at Bet365. Use the code NATION. Any final thoughts as we wrap up the podcast, fellas? Let's hope this team can kind of find something they haven't had all year. Like, just want to see the Oilers have some fight. Go out there, play physical, play hard, like, Bring a little bit of like a playoff vibe to this game against the Preds and just be like, you know what? Even if we don't win, every guy in that room I want there to be able to sit at the end of the game and be like, well, I did as the best I could. Liam, mm-hmm. thoughts? I think they'll be fine. I think they'll figure it out. I think this team's got more than enough players to survive a little bit of time without McDavid. I mean, it's not going to be easy, and there probably will be some stumbling blocks depending on how long it'll be, but they're one game under five hundred. They are. They were going. They were five hundred going into the game last night. I just mm-hmm. don't think they can be. <laughs> fingers crossed and knock on wood. Any worse than they were last night? Things surely have to get better. They're literally last everywhere <laughs> on the board. Yep, and they're a really good team. Or should be. Yep, I agree. The only thing I'll add is we learn that the Oilers win when there's a fight. I recommend a line brawl. Let's get everybody in the mix. Everybody in the pile. Can you imagine if we got like a Leon dry side of fight? Bang, bang, bang. Make your first punch a drop kick, Leon. <laughs> oh, and but then. like I wouldn't want to fight Leon dry side. That is a giant war machine coming at you. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Still you, haven't got one though. You wonder if, and again, hopefully this doesn't happen. If something happens on Thursday where things are not going well, like you get to the point out of like frustration, someone unlikely fights. You know, like Adam Henry dropped. Like a Nuge goes. fight? That's yeah, like what a I mean. Nuge like and something like that. Like, let's go. Like, let's play like... Crank your... up the urgency by yeah. like yeah. 12 I, notches. I here. think sometimes, too, like last night when they, you wanted to see that more intensity, it's like they're trying to get themselves back in the game and they're getting so many power play opportunities. And there probably is the fear of like, if we go to the box, we're getting scored on. Which isn't a good mentality just, either. Yeah, but have that. Yeah. No. Be, be, I also, one other thing, like, just be way stronger in front of your own net. Drives me nuts. Like um, the Mitchkov goal, going back a little bit, like that goal didn't have to happen if Brett Kulak just buried Mitchkov. Yes. Last night, uh, I don't know who drove the net, but on the Olivier goal, just put a bit of effort into him and knock that guy off his stride a little bit. Emerson was in front Emerson, of the net and yeah. just didn't. Just kind of stood there. Yeah, like Derek Ryan loses the battle in the corner. This is one of those ones where our friend Robin Browley would have said, put someone on their ass. Yeah. And here's the thing, too. Like, refs aren't going to call everything. Like, yeah. again, if Matthew Olivier is cutting into your crease and the puck is loose, why are you worried about trying to lift his sick? Knock him on his ass. Sure, maybe it's a penalty. Probably not with the way officiating goes. But maybe it's a penalty. Better than a goal against. Yeah. 
Either way, they got to up the urgency. They got to up the desperation. They got to up pretty much everything. Uh, we'll hope for the best. We'll be back on Friday. Enjoy the rest of your week, everybody. What's up, Nation citizens? If you like that video, then you need to be subscribed to the Oilers Nation YouTube podcast, live shows, exclusive interviews and analysis, everything you need from your favorite voices at Oilers Nation. And you don't want to miss any of it. So hammer that subscribe button.